Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. I am, um, man, it, it's great to be up here. I'm glad to be able to be teaching this morning. Um, I want to throw a giant caveat right out front. Um, you know that wicked cold flu bug thing that's been like racing around and like knocking people out? Um, I got that this week. It was kind of like really bad timing. And um, so like as of about yesterday, I was at about 65%. And so I have all the things I need up here. I've got like uh, the tea and the water and some Altoids to suck on, if anything. But if I suddenly go down, just give me a second to, to regain my, my coughing. And if, it, if I really go down, I might like call out to Brooke to come rescue me and grab the notes or something. But uh, I'm really looking forward to teaching today. Um, these, uh, the parables we're going to look at today are some, there's some of the most dearest to my heart that I can consider in the entire, of the New, Te- of the New Testament. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but this, this, uh, this last series has been really good so far. Uh, I, I, I feel like parables connect to us as humans in a way that other things don't. I'm, I'm, it's like the stories, uh, the images, the, the ideas, the metaphors, they connect to that deepest part of our humanness. Uh, that, that, that helps us understand what God thinks about us. Uh, it, it, they're deeply theological and yet deeply personal. If you guys recall back uh, about two weeks ago, Weston got up and he talked about kind of the nature of parables. And he said that all parables tend to extend uh, a, a, a little bit of a tension point and then also an invitation And so we're always kind of confronted by these two things, a tension that happens as a result of a story uh, and an invitation to step into it. Jesus loves to draw us into the middle of his stories. There's something about, he knows how we work, he knows how we're wired, he he brings us into our stories and then he refuses to leave us there. Uh, he, He wants to mess with us. He's good that way. As we read through the parables in the New Testament, we continue to see a theme over and over and over again. It was like Jesus' obsession, the kingdom of God. We're going we're gonna to come up with just a simple definition for it this morning to kind of to give us something to hold on to. The kingdom, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is that place where Jesus rules and reigns. So in these parables that Jesus continues to talk about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, we're going to see that as those places where Jesus has come and he is ruling and he's reigning, where his will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. And that, that idea, that central idea drives all that Matthew is trying to say in the middle of these stories. Now, you might be wondering, like, why? Why did Jesus keep talking about the kingdom? What was so important about this kingdom message? Well, to give just a little bit of, uh, kind of like a cliff note version, uh, back a little bit of context, the Jewish people had been awaiting, longing for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, In their mind, this is a promise that had been extended to them way back in the book of Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament and into the prophets. This this time when all things would be made back to the way they were supposed to be. When the Lord himself would come and rule and the Messiah would lead them forward. They were anticipating and waiting for this more than anything. And now Jesus was on the scene as a rabbi walking around and saying, that Messiah guy, that's me. And the kingdom of heaven is near. It's all around us. You guys remember back to two weeks ago when Weston was teaching, uh, he talked about the parable of the feasts. And I don't know if you remember, he mentioned that like all of these parables have like a little surprising meaning or a little twist in them. And his was this, look how vehemently, how passionately the master wants to fill his table. He's so excited about it, he, he's, he, he can't deal with there being empty spots. So he sends his servants out to come, fill his table. And that's the surprising twist. It's, it's pretty exciting, actually. And then last week, Brooke taught on the mustard seed in the yeast. And it's surprising meeting that God is using incredibly unexpected things, small things, 
to do amazing things in his kingdom. And his kingdom is growing everywhere. Everybody would have been sh- surprised, a little, a little shocked by that. And now we're coming to today's parable, which is actually really a pair of parables, a little bit of a tongue twister there. Um, the parables of the treasure in a field and the pearl of great price. And I'm sure you guys have heard of these ones before. And let's read them together. Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. Go ahead and turn there. It goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he'd found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Let's pray. Father, we, um, we're so thankful for your words. We're thankful for the fact that you inspired and filled uh, the writers and that you used your son, Jesus, to share these stories. And we know that your intent is that we would be changed. And so, Lord, even now, with the fragility of my voice, I feel weak. Lord, we need you to teach today. Use your word to change our hearts. We need to hear from you. Do not leave us the way we came. Our eyes are in you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. One of the first and most essential things that a journalist learns when they are learning how to write is to not bury the lead. Any of you have taken any journalist classes, you'll you'll remember hearing that. Now, don't bury the lead, which all that means is simply whatever it is, the most important thing that you have to say, your lead statement, make sure that you say that as soon as possible in the story that you're writing. Let's put it right up front, right out there so the reader doesn't miss it. And I kind of want to do that today. Uh, Unlike a lot of the parables uh, that we will be reading through, the meaning of these two parables are pretty intensely in your face. There's no getting around them. And here they are. Nothing in all of the universe is more valuable than following Jesus and his kingdom. And we should lay everything down to get it. Let me say that again. Nothing in all of the universe is more valuable than following Jesus and his kingdom. And we should lay everything down to get it. Just like God did. No sacrifice is too great. No cost is too grand. We lay down our life, and in the words of Jesus, we take up our cross and we follow with reckless abandon. That, that's the call, that's the message of these parables today. And, and they invite us in, and they mess with us, all of their tension and all of the invitation. And that is the heart of this story. So now that we've got that sorted, what do you guys want to talk about? I got about like 37 minutes or so. No. There's so much in these parables. There's so much being said in these parables. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend maybe like the next 15 or 20 minutes digging into each of them and kind of comparing them to each other a little bit and seeing the similarities and seeing the things that are different and then afterwards spending like the next 10 minutes figuring out what that means to us. You guys okay with that? Awesome, I'll take that as a yes. As a yes, we are okay with that, Tim. And, okay. (laughs) Um, Okay, before we jump into the actual parables, let me set the stage a little bit. Um, 
These two parables are actually a part of seven that fall in the center of, of Matthew's gospel. Uh, these are like the seven parables that sit right in the center of the entire gospel of Matthew. And then right in the middle of that, the, the, the biggest point of it is this kingdom message. And Jesus has literally, for the last like three or four of the parables, he's talked to an entire group of people, probably a lot the same size as this group. Uh, he was probably either out on a boat or on the side of a hill, and there was a massive group of people, and he's sharing these incredibly thought-provoking uh, stories and ideas. And then, as if to kind of like get away and to focus in a little bit, to try to, to kind of get people's minds and hearts together, he pulls a group of them into, uh, into a home. We think it might have been Peter's um, mother-in-law's home. And, and, and he continues the conversation. And first, he, he kind of unpacks the parable that he just told outside, but then he dives straight into these two parables. And the first of the parables were introduced to a man who's likely working in a field. Uh, and he stumbles across this treasure of extraordinary value. Now, in the Middle East, uh, burying your, uh, your prized possessions, burying your treasure was actually a common practice. There were banks, uh, uh, but the banks were a little bit unsecure, a little bit unreliable, and, and that combined with all of the like raiding and pillaging that happens, you know, like most of the Bible, um, it, it was kind of an unsafe place to go, an unsafe place to leave it. But the problem was, with burying it, is that those very same pillagings, those very same raidings, would often come in and wipe out entire communities. So you, you bury your treasure because you want to keep it safer than it is in the bank, but then the guy comes along and wipes everybody out. And so years go by, and this treasure remains buried in the field, sometimes decades, until until a gardener or a builder literally stumbles upon a king's hoard. So this is our scene. You've just been sent out by the master to go out, and there's this row of trees off the back end of the property that's kind of blocking a view down into the valley. And he says, hey, those end two trees, I'd like you to go and remove them. So you go out early in the morning, you take your shovel, and you begin digging around the roots. These trees are old. They've been around for a long time. And you're digging away, and you're digging away, and then finally you're, you're hitting something that's not dirt, and it's not rock. You're not really sure what it is. And it turns out that it's not one, it's not two, it's, it's three giant containers filled with gold coins. And this is a true story, by the way. This literally happened just several dec decades back. Well, what do you do? I mean, I, I mean, what does this guy do? I mean, he, he knows the law. And the, the Jewish law was that if you find it, you can keep it. That's, that's the rule. But he also knows the owner of the property. And if he tells the owner of the property, he's going to get kicked off the property, and then the treasure will be his. So he formulates a plan. He's going to rebury the treasure, and he's going to go away, and he's going to find the money to buy the land. The problem is, like Portland, property is very expensive. And so he goes away and he sells his house, and he sells his cow, he sells all of his furniture. He literally pulls the shirt off of his back. He sells his clothes. The word everything in that passage literally in the Greek means everything. He sells it all, all that he has. And then with joy, turns towards the owner and buys the land. He knows this is the best investment he will ever make in his entire life. His heart is exploding inside of him. This is the best decision he will ever make. I remember a moment in a sterile white Sunday school room after, after a youth group that had gone way too late. I was there late in the night. And I'd been wrestling for years with my, my feelings for one Brittany Lynn Syme, a beautiful petite senior who happened to be the pastor's daughter uh, and was also my best friend. Uh, I, had, I couldn't, in the last little while, I wasn't able to make sense of her emotions and some of her decisions. Can I get an amen, man? <laughs> and what's more is that I already had felt a little bit rejected 
And, and, and I, was, I was afraid. I was afraid of making a stupid decision that was going to cost me like my best friend. But then it happened. In this sterile classroom, these words came out of her mouth. Of course I like you. How could you not see that? I don't know. <laughs> the words landed on me like a crashing wave, and I was swept off my feet. And I knew in that moment, it was, like, it was like one of those moments from a movie where everything else disappears, and there's just the one thing. In that moment, I would give whatever, I would pay whatever, I would, I would do whatever to have her heart. The joy to have that treasure. And, and that's what's going through this man's mind. This is a no-brainer. I will have that treasure. Let's take a quick look at the key components of the story. We're introduced to a man. He has no, he's just working. He bumps into a treasure that's been hidden for a long time. He finds it, and then his heart explodes with joy, and he goes, and he sells all that he has to get the field, to get the treasure. Next parable. This time, we're introduced to a merchant, but not just any merchant. This merchant buys and sells one of the most valuable commodities in the ancient world, pearls. Pearls were the prized possession of kings and queens and the very rich and powerful. In fact, it was very common for kings to actually search the world over to find pearls of such tremendous value that they would literally represent their kingdom's authority and, and their vast wealth. And then they would be buried with that pearl as a symbol of their power. And so these kings, they would send people out, and merchants would roam all over in marketplaces and in docks, trying to find these incredible, large, exquisite treasures and bring them back to sell. So here's our scene. You're a merchant. Maybe, maybe you're working for a king or maybe, maybe it's just, uh, you're, you're just in the business and you've been doing this for a long time. You've got lots of pearls. You know what a good pearl looks like and you know what something special is and, and, and you are looking for something that you've never seen before, something to top them all. And so you do, you, 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 you go to the marketplaces, you go to the docks, you check, you go all over the known kingdom till finally you hear a rumor of somebody in a far off distant corner of the kingdom. And you get on a boat and you go out and you meet the man out on a dock and he comes walking towards you and he's got a wooden leg and a patch over one of his eyes. Yeah. He looks at you and says, all right, here you've been looking. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, he, he, he looks at you and he's like, I, you know, do you, do you want a pearl? I got a pearl. And he, and he pulls up out of his piratey vest a pearl the size of a grapefruit. You've never seen anything like this before. This is so much bigger than any pearl you've ever seen, and it's perfect. It's perfectly round. It's so white that it practically glows. It, it, it's exquisite. In that moment, you start to wrestle like, I, I, I don't want to sell this pearl. I want this pearl. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And you know that you should buy it. You know that you should get it and bring it back. Just like this man, he probably knew. He's like, I should be bringing this back, but, but it's just so beautiful. It's what I've always been looking for. And so, you formulate a plan. You're going to sell everything that you have to buy the pearl. The problem is, you deal in pearls. And it means selling all of your other pearls to get this pearl, which is kind of bad for business. So you look back, you take one more long look at the pearl, and then you go to your stash and you sell everything that you have to buy that pearl. 
Let's take a look at the two compo- at the components again of this story. There's a merchant, and, and this person knows their business, and they've been searching for an amazing pearl, a pearl better than any that has ever been seen, and they find it. And in the moment, they make a decision to sell all of their other pearls to get that one. Now, I want to compare the different pieces of these two parables to each other. And we can take a look at some of the differences and some of the similarities, and we we can kind of get some deeper understanding. Let's take a look first at the differences. The first difference that we see kind of leaping out there is this, is the difference between the hiddenness and the searching. You see, there's a there's a pretty different, there's a pretty big distinction between the two main characters in this story. Uh, the first character was simply going about his business. When he stumbled into this amazing treasure, his head was down, he was probably pulling weeds or digging a ditch somewhere. And he's as surprised as anybody that he should stumble upon such an amazing find. Whereas the second person is on a mission. They know what they're looking for. They're searching. They're discontent with their current merchandise. And they want something more. No, they want something better. They knew. They knew that there had to be more out there. And surprise of all surprise, in their search they find more than they could have ever imagined. The man who was digging in the field was not searching for a treasure. He came on it by chance. The man who was searching for pearls spent his life looking, no matter how the discovery was made. In that moment, their response was exactly the same. Everything had to be sold or sacrificed to gain that precious thing. Now, remember who Jesus is telling this parable to, right? This is a group of his closest. And, and, and like there, here in this room, many of you are kind of one of those two people, weren't you? Maybe you were the person who was just kind of going about life and you bumped into the kingdom. Or maybe it was a coworker, or somebody at school. And in that moment, you encountered something you'd never conceived of, you'd never seen before. It's a powerful act of goodness, something that you couldn't explain, and you go, I want that. I've got to have that. And so you stepped into the kingdom. Or maybe, maybe you're like the merchant. You're, you're the person who, who has been looking their whole life for something that's missing. And then one day you found it. It was Jesus. It was his kingdom. And from that day forward, you've never been the same. No matter which direction you came from, the dest- our destinations were the same. We were, in the, in the words of Hebrews 11, searching for a better country, looking forward to the city whose architect is God, and that choice was placed in front of us. Now, the second difference that really leaps out when we look at these two parables is the absence of the word joy in the second one. And to be honest, as I read and researched, I'm not really sure why there's an absence there. There's some speculation. Um, some people think that maybe it was because the merchant was more of, a, more of a, a thoughtful, reflective decision. Others say that maybe it's just assumed. Maybe the joy was assumed. But often, biblical writers would use the absence of a word to draw attention to the word really pointing at joy as being one of the central and most important things that we can take away from these two parables. The choice to sell all was not made begrudgingly. Let me say that again. The choice to sell everything was not made begrudgingly. The choice was a joyful choice. Which reminds me of of another passage and another decision um, in Hebrews. You don't have to turn there, but Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, it's up on the screen, says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And here it is. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, it was joy, the joy that was set before Jesus that helped him go all the way to the cross to lay down his life for us. Jesus was joyfully motivated by the treasure that awaited him. And the author of Hebrews holds this out to us as readers. He says, he says you can use that joy too. That same joy can help you endure difficult things. It can help you face the obstacles that you have to face in this life that's around us. But let's return back to the comparison of these two parables and look at some of the similarities. The first one is the person. Whether uh, it's a man or a woman or whether it's a merchant or a king or a teacher or a student, there's something individual about this call makes it a little bit unique from other parables. We are asked to place ourselves in the very personal role of the finder. It's like the parable calls you to come in. You are the finder. And it draws us in, and we are faced with a choice that cannot be made by any other person. The parable seems to ask us, how would you respond? second thing that we see as a similarity up there is between the treasure and the pearl. Both of these things are presented as supremely valuable. As we mentioned earlier, Jesus and his kingdom of the most utmost and incredible value in all of the universe. We hear it ringing in our heads. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. There is nothing of greater value that even Our own king, Jesus, would lay down his life to usher it in. That's how valuable it was. The third similarity up there is the relationship between this finding and this selling of everything and buying. Which is, of course, the only worthy response of such an amazing discovery. It was the great American missionary, South American missionary, Jim Elliott, who said this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Elliot would give his own life in that pursuit. He would lay down his own life in South America to usher in the kingdom. As I mentioned, everything means everything. But the problem is, the problem is, is that it's usually not everything that, that trips us up, is it? It's usually not everything that keeps us from following wholeheartedly. It's often just like one or two things, which reminds me of a story. And I need to preface this story by saying, please don't report me. Um, it was probably about 15 years ago. Uh, my, wa- my wife and I, uh, we had made the decision to like basically sell everything, and we were heading overseas to go plant a church in Scotland. And a part of that was is that we needed to spend about a year in California doing some training. And, uh, and, and when we did all that, we did that incredible move down there. Things actually got kind of rough. We, we, went, we found out that we were pregnant. We had another baby. We got down there, got pregnant again with number three, uh, three under two and a half. It was crazy. My wife is a superhero. Um, 
And, and, and honestly, that season in California was kind of dark time. So I, as a good husband, uh, would often wake up early and try to get the kids out of the house. And on one of those times, I was taking them for a jog. I thought I could take Duncan and Kelton out for a jog. Duncan was a toddler. Uh, Kelton was a little baby. They're over here right there. It's hard to even imagine them that way. Um, and, 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 and we, but we only had this jogger stroller that like went in a straight line. This was before the whole like jogger strollers that had the weird flop, floppy front. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like now they, they, the tires go all over the place. This was like a fixed thing. It only went in a straight line. If you wanted to turn, you had to like push down and move. And, and then jog. Okay, is everybody with me? Okay. So I was going out for a jog that morning. Uh, it's, it was only a one-person jogger stroller. So I did the right thing. I uh, took Kelton, the baby, and I bundled him up in the five-point harness, and then I slid Duncan beside him. <laughs> that's, that's what Jesus would do. And so I was out for a run, and, and, and I'm running along, and of course, Duncan's like, Daddy, go faster, faster, Daddy, but I'm not a really fast runner, so I did the classic dad jog thing, which is give him a push, <laughs> and then run up, catch up to it, give him a push, okay? Now, don't judge me. How many dads in the room know exactly what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes, of course, this is what we do. Uh, and, you know, we'd been going for a little while, and it was about time where we were kind of rounding a corner, and we we're getting to the end. And bear in mind, this is a very clean, mom's in the room, this is a very clean road. There was no rocks, it was, it was asphalt, it was wide, there was no obstacles. Uh, but I figured this was probably the last one, and so I wanted to give him one last good push. And so I, with like all the strength I could muster, just threw my weight into it, and launched them forward. Now, wouldn't you know it? There was one pebble. I mean, it was barely even a rock. I mean, it was like that big. The tire width is only that big. And physics tells me it should have just bumped right over top of it with no problems. But that's not what happened because this pebble had a gravity of its own and locked that tire in place. And the whole thing became a makeshift catapult that launched <laughs> my children. <laughs> and this all happened about like six, seven feet away from me. And I went into panic mode. All I could see was my totally turned over stroller and two sets of feet sticking out of the hedge in front of me. And I had one of those like Batman moments where I'm like, oh my goodness, well, who do I go to first? I need to help whom, what am I going to do? And so I picked the baby first and I picked the stroller up and I flipped it over and Kelton wasn't even crying. He was just, his eyes were wide. <laughs> yeah. I was, like, I was like, just breathe, buddy, just breathe. And then I went over to Duncan and I kind of shuttled him out of the hedge and he was kind of scraped up on his face, and he just looked up to me, Daddy, why? <laughs> it, it, only, it only takes a pebble. And isn't that kind of the way life is? Like, it's, it's not the big, it's all these little things that stop us from our everything. We want to step in, we want to engage, but there's so many of these pebbles on the way that stop us from selling everything and following with abandon. N.T. Wright has this amazing quote. The gospel of the kingdom isn't a pleasant religious idea that you might like to explore sometime when you've got an hour or two to spare. It isn't like an attractive object in a museum that you might visit and look at admiringly the next time that you're in the district. It's like a fabulous hoard of treasure, yours for the taking if you sell everything else to buy the field where it's hidden. It's like the biggest, finest, purest pearl that any jeweler ever imagined, and it's yours for the taking if you sell everything else, including all the other pearls you've ever owned, in order to purchase it. Now, I get it. I get it. In, in this age with so many distractions and so many comforts and so many people and things competing for our time, how do we count the cost 
of everything? I believe the answer is Jesus. And if you ask any of my students from the school, they'll tell you about 90% of the time it is the answer. We do it by following our king. And here's the twist in the story. It's because Jesus is not only our example, he is also our backer. You see, it it was he who paid the price. He paid the price. He, he, He made the money available to buy the field. He paid the price for the pearl. He paid it. And now he simply stands there and beckons you to come. I did the heavy lifting. Now, come on, let's go. I grew up in Canada, and uh, I'm used to real snow. (laughs) And and I have this image in my mind, and frankly, I don't even remember exactly when it happened, um, but I just, it's burned in my brain, and I remember it clearly, being parked out in front of our house, and it was on a snowy, blizzardy day, and I remember getting out of the truck, and I remember my dad walking ahead of me in the snowbank, and I remember stepping in the big steps behind him in the snowbank. That's it, you guys. That's how we do this. One step at a time where our Father has stepped, we step behind one step at a time. Because with Jesus selling everything, it's not a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. And it involves steps. And for some of you, those steps are big. So there's some people in this room right here, right now, uh, that, that God is calling you to literally sell everything that you have on this side of the ocean and move to the other side of the ocean to bring the gospel, to bring the kingdom in another place where they haven't tasted or, or experienced it yet. My, my family's done that. It's amazing. Those steps are huge, but it is an amazing adventure. And for others of you in this room, It means sacrificing time or energy or or resources to love somebody who's really hard to love and don't nudge the person beside you right now. (laughs) Though, for some of you, it might mean getting off the couch and helping your spouse with the dishes. The kingdom shows up in all these unexpected places. And for some of you, it might be as simple as Starting a West Side community, taking one night a week and making a sacrifice to step in, inviting people in to experience the kingdom in your home. It looks different for everything, everybody. But whatever it is, I guarantee you it's a step because it's impossible to follow anybody without taking steps. And to follow Jesus means to take steps. So let's circle back to where we began. The driving lead of our message. Let's get it up there. Nothing in all of the universe is more valuable than following Jesus and his kingdom. And we should lay everything down to get it. Jesus put it this way in Luke 9, 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Which leads us to the point of tension that these parables bring out. And the tension is, what will we choose? It's it's right out there. What are you going to choose? It's like we're standing in the field with the treasure in front of us, or maybe we're standing in front of our pirate friend, And we're on the edge of our toes and we're asking ourselves that question, am I willing? We can hear Jesus' voice. It's calling out to us, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all of these other things, these distractions and all these problems and worries, they'll fade into the sunset. But it's too hard to hear over the noise of that next Black Friday sale event or the recent iPhone release says. Yeah, you all know what I mean. 
So we stand instead for hours outside of our favorite, uh, our favorite store. I mean, some people even sleeping in tents to save a few bucks. But Jesus is simply whispering, would you follow me? Would you sacrifice everything? Would you be willing to look across the street at the homeless couple standing on the same sidewalk? The treasure is there for the taking. The pearl simply waits to be grabbed. Am I willing? And it's here, it's inside of this that we actually find our invitation. Jesus extends and says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Because Jesus doesn't give up and he doesn't let up. He won't quit. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many times you've made the wrong choice or how many times you've put anything else in front of him. He continues to extend the invitation. Would you follow? He's good that way. And he knows that the only proper response to the kingdom is everything. But the trick is, this is is not all that there is to these stories. In fact, we have one more tension point. Matthew is quite clever. He was a good writer, and and he actually took these two parables and he sandwiched them between two other parables. And in doing it, he creates a second point of tension for us as readers. Now remember again, when this is happening, Jesus is in that inner circle. These are all people that he knows, he loves, they're disciples, or people who have chosen to follow him. Many of them have made sacrifices. And remember also that a lot of these guys were fishermen. So the parable that he's about to tell is one that they would have known. They would have already known the punchline when he was like two words into it. And he would have have set it up. He was setting it up. He would say, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then in the next parable, he says, and the kingdom of heaven is like. And then in this third one, he says, and again, the kingdom of heaven is like. All of that room would have been hanging on his words anticipating what he was going to say next. And this is what he says. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus tells us that the world is sharply divided into those who have chosen a path of wickedness and those who have chosen a path of righteousness. Those who have chosen to step in their father's steps and those who have chosen not to. Those who have been swept off their feet by Jesus and his kingdom and those who have rejected the gospel. Tension point number two is... There is a timeline. Now, we have the ability to make the choice now, and Jesus beckons us to make the choice. But a day is coming when that choice will pass. And I know, I know sitting in this room, there are people from the first camp. There there are those people here who were just like that guy who found a treasure in the field. And your life has been turned upside down. And you've been trying to figure out even what to do with this treasure that God has given you. And every day you're learning what it means to be generous. And every day you're learning to step into kindness. Or maybe you're like the merchant and you were just born discontent. That was me. That was my story. I knew there had to be more. This world wasn't good enough. There had to have been more out there. Until I encountered a king who radically transformed my heart and my life and remade me into something different. 
But there is a third group of people in this room. And you are standing at the edge and you're trying to make a decision if you should follow with all that you are. You may be saying something like, I'll follow Jesus eventually. But isn't it amazing how long you've been telling yourself that? My friend, Jesus stands before you now and extends a hand and he beckons you to come. He's already done the heavy lifting. He's already paid the price. Now just follow him. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. None of us do. Are you willing?